Thank you so much for tuning in to the logs. Coming up, episode 6, Living the Grandest Lie. They say that acting is the grandest lie, but who's they? Well, they happen to be a man named Konstantin Stanislavski, a theater actor, director, and actor trainer who developed his own system of training actors to be the best because he felt that an actor mustn't only play a character, they must embody a character. Their training must go beyond the physical and vocal exercises needed to play. They needed to experience. Stanislavski created his art of experiencing, his own system of trainer acting, to activate the consciousness of an actor in order to lead their unconscious. And in doing so, they can empathize more fully with the character they're playing. Because if they understand their character at this core, very deep level, they can understand the experiences that that character has undergone. And they build a life for that character beyond the show, play, or movie, beyond the script that they follow. When it's necessary to draw emotion for a scene, they can then draw emotion from pieces of that character's life that haven't even been expressed in the work. And they can make their character seem like a well rounded character, a person a person capable of experiencing those feelings, and a person that the audience understands is a person. And this is what actors in Stanislavski's mind were supposed to be able to do. Make the audience believe that you are that character. You're not yourself anymore. Don't simply deliver a performance. Deliver a life. Deliver an experience. And truly connect yourself to the person that you're playing. And you could see that teaching very apparent today. Stanislavski was very active in the actor scene at the late 19th and early 20th century. But his teachings are so pervasive. Look at a talk show where an actor goes and promotes their movie. The talk show host will frequently say, So your character, so-and-so, is doing this in this one, right? And then when the actor responds, in their answer they use I and me, not them or they, or he or she, because in their mind, they are that person. They say things like, well, in this one, I go on this journey, and it's a hard journey for me, stuff like that. But the character went on that journey. You never did. I mean, they may have shot on location and things like that and been the physical location that the character was in. But the emotional journey that the character goes on was not literally felt by the person because they didn't live it. They played it. And now the question comes to mind of how can we do this as a species and as individuals? How can we abandon what we know and take upon new experiences that we physically have not experienced? How can an actor that plays a role in space or in some sci-fi movie or in some fantasy movie empathize with what the character is going through? Because there's no way in the physical world to do so. What we get into when we think about something like this is the human capability to bend their own truth and to embody roles that may even be unnatural to them. And on this episode, we're going to go on that sociological journey and we're going to tap into that human psyche. And today, we're going to discover why it just may be human nature that we're able to do those things, that we're able to bend the truth for ourselves, and that we're able to live lives that we haven't. And furthermore, live lives that we must. So now we've spoken of actors, and we've said that their trade funnels a grand lie upon the audience, since the very best actors trick the audience into thinking that they are the character that they're playing. But we always live in some sort of a lie, because we're not always telling the truth, the full truth, because we're always leaving out pieces of ourselves when we're interacting, pieces that may not fit that situation, or pieces that you just don't want to show. 
things that we perceive as way too personal. And when we talk about things like this, we get into the idea of the three faces. And you may have heard of this theory. I'm sure you've experienced it. What it is is a very common saying in Japanese culture. What the Japanese say is that you have three faces as a person. Your first face is what you show to the world. It's your most public face. The emotions, experiences, and the actions that you undergo when you're in public settings. Then there's a second face. The second face you show to your close friends and to your family. This face is a little bit more personal. This face is shown to people that have similar experiences to you. People that you may have grown up with in terms of family and very close friends. People that you trust to show more of yourself. And then there's a third face. This third face you never show to anyone. This third face is the truest reflection of who you are. Here we contain our personal truths and our vulnerabilities. Things that make up the core of what we are. The being that we've become. This third face is the truth. It's your truth. And you don't share that with anyone. And these three faces are varied depending on the setting. In any setting, one face may be shown, and in another, another will be. When we are with other people, the first two faces are shown in the public realm and in the more private realm. The only setting where you're the most true is when you're with yourself, in your own mind, with your own thoughts. And that's true for everyone. No one reveals their truest self. But what we do is we act in accordance with that self. We know inside who we are. And when we go and interact with people, we bend that self to fit the situation that we're placed in, to fit the face that you want to show. And there is a sociological theory behind this, and it's very much like acting. The theory proposed by Eric Goffman was the dramaturgical theory. And in the dramaturgical theory, you as an individual are an actor. And the way he describes it is that there's a front stage and there's a backstage. The front stage is you putting on a front and acting for an audience. And the backstage features actions that maybe only a few people, very close people, or maybe nobody knows about. So the front stage can be described as faces one and two, those faces that are shown to the public, to other people. And the backstage, only you know about, because only you know about what's going on in your head. So imagine a scenario like this. Imagine there's a girl, and what she loves to do when she's at home by herself, she loves to chill on the couch, play some video games, she turns on some music, watches some TV. Oh no, I'm describing my personal Frankenstein. There's a, there's a good cut for those of you that have been paying attention. But nonetheless, she loves being very private, kind of relaxing with herself, maybe with her pet. And when she's in that situation, she is her truest self. And then one of these nights, she gets a text from her friends. It's this group chat, and they're like, oh, come on, you got to get out and uh, go to the bar. Uh, we're all going to hang out, listen to some music there, and you should tag along and get some drinks. And now her truest self says, I'd rather just be here, because here I'm alone with my own thoughts. I can be who I truly am. I'd rather relax, sit, turn on a movie. But she texts back, yeah, sure, I'll be there in an hour. And why? She does so to maintain friendships. And when she's at that front stage, she's manipulating her backstage. She's taking away aspects of her true life to fit what she wants her friends to see her as, as a cool, fun-loving, bubbly, life-of-the-party person. But why do we manipulate ourselves in this way? Why are we trying to fit roles in our society? And of course, does this next idea have a name? And of course, you know, it does. Science just needs to have a new uh, slogan. There is a theory for that. Well, the dramaturgical theory fits very well with what Eric Goffman called impression management. And impression management is when a person manipulates their backstage self to fit the present situation. Now, the backstage self of this girl still loved music, so she's like, yeah, I'll go tag along. And she bends her personality to fit that cool, fun-loving music, let's go party sort of attitude. Now imagine that same girl in class. She's at university, in a core class, maybe her science class. And how does she behave there? She's quiet, writing in her notebook, paying attention, very attentive to what the professor is saying, maybe raising her hand, answering a question. Again, she's manipulating her backstage self. In the backstage, she's very relaxed. And she highlights that aspect of her personality in that situation, in the classroom. Imagine another scenario. She's going to have lunch with her parents. In that scenario, she's very respectful, maybe very loyal, attentive to what her parents are telling her, taking their advice. Now imagine yet another scenario. 
walking down the hall of her university and she happens to glance upon the person that she likes. In this scenario, she maybe acts more shy to kind of hide pieces of herself that she feels are vulnerable. She's very kind, too. She expresses joy. She says, how's your day? Things like that. Very kind things. Things that stem from her maybe being a, a pet owner. She's very kind to other people, to other animals, other creatures. And now imagine another scenario. Man, we're putting this, uh, we're really putting this girl through the ringer. Now in this one, she's at home playing some video games. Maybe she's playing Call of Duty with her friends. And she's like going super hardcore, screaming into the mic. Oh, you should have got him. How did you miss him? And this is all the same person, but she's operating at different levels in different situations. She's acting, acting in accordance with those roles in what the situation wants her to be. And we all do this because we all manipulate and manage what our backstage self is in the public world. Because everyone is putting on an act towards the people that they're interacting with. See how well the words work out there? Nice. And over time, with many people, these specific actions become societal norms. Just think, how are you supposed to behave in church versus how are you supposed to behave at a sporting event? How do you behave when you meet somebody for the first time? And how do you behave when you run into your closest friend? How do you behave at a restaurant when you're ordering food? And how do you behave at your home when you're cooking something up with your family? These are all scenes in the actor's life. And you are the actor. And next, we're going to take you, the actor, on a conversation about class. What are you thinking when I say, oh, you have class, or he has class, or she has class, or by golly, he's a class act. Those people are full of class. What does that mean? Can we identify what class is? And here, to get this conversation started, I'll read you a little excerpt from this book, by Howard E. Ferguson, called The Edge, The Guide to Fulfilling Dreams, Maximizing Success, and Enjoying a Lifetime of Achievement. Now, if you didn't get the summary of the book from the title, it's about maximizing yourself in social settings and having an edge when it comes to interactions with other people. And Ferguson argues that having that edge will allow you to move towards what you want and achieve your goals. And now here's what he says when somebody raises the question of what is class? Here's his definition. And quote, class never runs scared. It is sure-footed and confident in the knowledge that you can meet life head on and handle whatever comes along. Those who have class have wrestled with their own personal angel and won a victory that marks them thereafter. Class never makes excuses. It takes its lumps and learns from past mistakes. Class is considerate of others. It knows that good manners are nothing more than a series of petty sacrifices. Class bespeaks an aristocracy that has nothing to do with ancestors or money. The most affluent blue blood can be totally without class, while the descendant of a Welsh miner may ooze class from every pore. Class never tries to build itself up by tearing others down. Class is already up and need not strive to look better by making others look worse. Class can walk with kings and keep its virtue, and talk with crowds and keep the common touch. Everyone is comfortable with the person who has class, because he is comfortable with himself. If you have class, you don't need much of anything else. If you don't have it, no matter what else you have, it doesn't make much of a difference. End quote. What is he describing there, other than just how to act in a variety of different situations? He's describing the right way to act in every one of those situations, right? He says that class is considerate of others. He says that class has good manners. Okay, both great things to be. He says that class can walk with kings. Awesome, you're not losing your virtue when you're rising up. And he says that class can keep the common touch. Don't lose yourself and disconnect yourself from the people. And when it comes down to it, class in every one of these situations is just a right way to act. The different situations that the person of class is placed in whether it's with the kings or with the common people, they define various situations with wholly different methods of action. What is class other than that? Class is just the right course of action for the situations that we've commonly put ourselves in. And that right course of action is determined by us because we've set as a society that in that situation, we want that course of action. And take this example. This is a fun one. 
where you walk into an elevator, what do you do when you walk into an elevator? The doors open, you walk in, maybe there's a couple people with you, you turn, you press the button, and all the while you're staring front at the buttons, maybe you're looking down at your phone. Imagine if you did that same thing, you're walking into an elevator, imagine there are a couple people in the elevator, and you just stare at them. Your back is at the door, you're staring into the elevator. Isn't that a wrong course of action in that situation? And there's no law against that action, right? It's just what we've built up as a society. And it would be very funny to try because other people's reaction would be like, what the hell is this person doing? And we would all feel similarly if we were placed in that situation because we've become so accustomed to correct courses of action in correct situations. What this phenomenon is called is informal social sanction. These are the usually unexpressed but widely understood rules of group membership. They're basically the unspoken rules of the social life. And that's social life in whatever society that you're in, because these can change based on the society that you're in, like actions can change based on the situation that you're in. In one society, you may be experiencing one situation much more than another, and through positive or negative reinforcement of that action, it is continued or stopped. And now, what do we mean by that? Take the example with the elevator again. When you walk in and you stand the wrong way in the elevator, people will say, like what we said before, what is this guy doing? They're going to shun that action, negatively reinforce it, try to stop it, even unconsciously, because they are accustomed to the right way to act when you're in an elevator. In their head, they'll say, what, what's the issue here? They may shoot disapproving looks, because you all know that feeling when somebody's kind of watching you weirdly. Maybe you're thinking that they're thinking, what is going on with this person? They are ridiculing you if you are the person that's standing awkwardly in the elevator physically, which is turning into a social action. Their physical disapprovement is trying to change your unnatural action. And in undergoing those disapproving actions, they're preserving one method of action in that situation. Basically saying, without actually saying, you can only stand one way in an elevator. And when you, the person standing the wrong way in the elevator, sees that statement represented physically, you see disapprovement on the part of your community. And you would stop that action for the hope of being included by your peers in your community. And that is a natural thing because people want to be included amongst other people. You're basically telling yourself, okay, I better stop doing this so that I'm not shunned by other people. And that's a negative reinforcement of that elevator action. And whatever these negative actions may be, saying something inappropriate or acting inappropriately, and you can make many examples for these things, whatever they are, they can be considered to be taboo. What is it when something's taboo? It's simply prohibited or restricted by some social action, some custom. We can make it taboo to stand the wrong way in the elevator, just like it's taboo to curse in front of your parents or your grandparents, right? And now if we look at actions in a public setting in terms of a scale, in the middle, it's just normal actions. And then there's two ends. And these actions, these taboo actions, make up that low end of what actions are, the wrong end of what actions should be in a situation. So what makes up the other end? It's class. When you have class in situations, you're going at the cusp of what you should be doing in that situation. Take this situation. You're in a hallway. You're standing and you're waiting for something. Maybe you're waiting for your class or a meeting. And somebody walks by. They're holding a bunch of papers. And they kind of trip and they, and they drop all the papers. A normal action on you as a witness of that would be to go up and say, oh, let me help you out. Let me pick up the papers for you. And that is a good action. You go, you help them out, and then you kind of send them on their way. Now, a classy action would be like, hey, you know what? I'll take half, you take half, let's take them to wherever you need. I'm still waiting for this class, so I've got some time. That's class. It's dealing with social situations at the highest level of correct action. Now, just for fun, what would be the taboo action in that same scenario? It would probably be you watch them trip and all the papers fall and you just stand there. Maybe you watch them or maybe you laugh. That is a wrong course of action. Take another example. There's a boy going to pick up his date for the prom. He's going to his date's parents' house, you know, where she's living, and he's going to go pick her up and take her to the prom. It is a correct course of action to go knock on the door, say hi, and then leave for the prom. That action is full of class. When that same kid brings flowers, knocks on the door, shakes the father's hand, he tells the dad his name, he says, we're going to be home by this time, stuff like that. Then he hands the flowers to the mother, his date comes down, he says, wow, she's so pretty, they take some pictures, and then they go to the prom. That is the pinnacle of class in that sort of situation. Because you're going beyond what is merely deemed as acceptable. 
what the right action is in that situation. You're on the good half of that scale that we talked about earlier, above the normal course of action that should just be done anyway. And when we say anyway, when we refer to the normal actions in that scale, the middle ground, we refer to socially correct actions that we're supposed to undergo either way. We have to remember that when we're studying these actions and we're thinking about class. Because every action is based in a scene, and every action is undergone by an actor. And as we've said before, when these actions occur in similar scenes and are done by actors in similar situations, they can become social norms. That's why things like informal social sanctions exist, to create normalcy within the society. Because as we've discussed before, like what we did in episode one, humans enjoy certainty, a status quo, because things become predictable in certain situations. And that's especially good in our lives, which can be very unpredictable. But what these things do, what class-based actions do, is that they can lead to classification and social stratification. Because those individuals that undergo a specific type of action and are frequently placed in a situation where that action is supposed to be undergone, they become a group. And as we've said before, how you behave in different situations, say, at a church or at a restaurant or at a friend's house, those are all different social settings. And you can adhere actions to the people within those settings, actions that function as normal on our scale from taboo to normal to class. And you can classify them. You can classify the church-going people. You can classify party people. You can classify foodies, people that love to go to restaurants and experience new food. But the problem with the human psyche is when we do that, we create groups because we're trying to organize our world. So we stock people into certain social classes. And these actions could function to identify like the typical churchgoer, the typical partier, and you kind of organize attributes of that person within your mind. And that's not to say that a person that goes to church can also go to parties is just serving as an example here. But what happens when we classify large subsets of people and we turn to prejudice and we make it an us versus them situation? What happens when we classify to dehumanize? We make systems of class. Social stratification segregates our society into groups of people, into class systems, into social castes. The greatest example of this caste-based classification system is the caste system in India, which has been around for nearly 3,000 years now. The Indian caste system comes mainly from their religion. A majority of Indian people are Hindu, and they follow this authoritative book called, and pardon my pronunciations for the rest of these words that we're going to cover soon, this book is called the Manusmriti. And it's a book containing the laws, the Hindu law. And it actually dates back a thousand years before even Christ was born. That's why up until now it's been about 3,000 years of this caste system. Because this book highlights the caste system. And the caste system is thought to come from the Hindu god Brahma. And what this does is divide into four categories Indian people based on Brahma. So the four main categories are the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas and the Shudras. Again, pardon my pronunciation. And they all come from Brahma, because Brahma is considered the god of creation in Hindu culture, and these four groups are created from him. So at the top are the Brahmins, and they're considered to be the, the teachers and the priests, the intellectuals of the population, the high-minded individuals, and they're considered to come from his head. And the second group, the Kshatriyas, are thought to come from his arms, Brahma's arms, and they include the warriors and the ruling class of the civilization, considered from their strength, strength that they provide to hold up the civilization, to make the civilization work. The Vaishyas, the third class, are the traders, and they were created from Brahma's thighs. They support the economy, just as the thighs support the rest of the body, the torso, the arms, and the head. At the bottom are the Shudras, and they came from Brahma's feet. And what they do are the menial jobs that no one in the civilization wants to do, and they have to do. And that's why the Shudras are considered to hold up the rest of the civilization, be the largest of these castes. Now these are the four main groups, the main categories of the Hindu caste system. They can be further divided 3,000 times into 3,000 castes, and 25,000, about 25,000 more subcastes. And that's based on specific things like their occupation or the person. And there's another group, a group 
outside of the Hindu caste system. These are the Dalits, or the untouchables, the outcasts. These are street sweepers and latrine cleaners. These are the lowest of the low, that they can't even be included in the civilization, in the social stratification, these four main groups that make up Indian society. And these systems divided Indian society so distinctly that people lived in segregated colonies. They couldn't share the same water. They couldn't share the same food. A Brahmin, for example, couldn't take food from a Shudra. It was considered taboo. And you could only marry within your caste. And now modern Indian society has tried to blend these social classes and remove the groups like outcasts and make everything more fair for people. But they still exist to a point. And even if you go back 100, 150 years, you can see this in full force. And they serve as a great example for how class can turn into classification and how classification can turn into stratification. And these divisions of class can go beyond occupational segregation. In the United States, we are very well versed in racial segregation, in things like the Jim Crow laws in the southern states in the late 19th and in the early 20th centuries. In our modern time, these things occur. And they go back to dehumanizing people. They go back to actions not even under your control. The word born is a verb. It's an action that a person can undergo because in a sentence you use it as a verb. But you can't control if you're born or not. Furthermore, you can't control to who you were born. And even beyond that, you can't control what you look like. You cannot control the color of your skin. So it's puzzling that this entire time we've been talking about stratification, go back one, classification, go back one, class, once more, action. All this time we've been talking about dividing people by action, action that they undergo, and yet here we find an instance where uncontrollable action, like being born a certain skin color, is used to classify. It's used as a method of stratification. It's used as a method of dehumanization. Because remember, when we talk about class systems, we talk about people that exhibit similar behavior in similar situations. What kind of behavior is what you look like? There's no behavior behind that. It's just how it is. So why do we classify based on that? Now that's a question that's hard to answer because we still haven't fully answered it. We haven't answered the question of social class and social stratification, why it occurs. But what we can turn to, maybe to see some explanation, is science. We could turn to biology, evolutionary biology, and we could turn to population dynamics within biological systems. Because as humans, we are biological systems. We are predisposed to certain actions because we are acting as organisms, as an individual, working towards something, some goal, which is usually survival and reproduction. And how we achieve those goals as humans is by maintaining communal structures, by living within society. In general, when we look at things in science, hard sciences like chemistry, biochemistry, organic chemistry, physics, we identify processes that occur in the earth at their most stable form. Because at their most stable form, they occur the most the least reactive substance, the most stable orientation of a molecule, the least energetically active. And biology likes it when populations of organisms function in a similar vein. Because as we've said before, when the status quo is maintained, it's easy for individuals to understand other action. And nature looks for this. It looks for the most evolutionary adaptive strategy for all life. Anything. It doesn't only have to be humans. It includes all other animals and plants. And when individuals behave similarly, action can be predicted, and more importantly, action can be acted upon. We're going to try to use a fun example this time. Take flamingos. Chilean flamingos, Andean flamingos, flamingos anywhere in the world. You've seen a flamingo, right? It's a big pink bird, a very long neck, and a black beak. Well, we're going to use the flamingo as our actions can be acted upon example, because when flamingos go to mate, they do a dance. What flamingos do is that they just, in a mass of flamingo, they dance together, male and female flamingos, and they dance and they prop up their neck and move their beak left to right, left to right, left to right. Maybe they put on some music. 
Hey baby, you come to this knee-high patch of water often? How about we flamingo over there where we have a little bit of privacy? No, no, they don't do that. No, they turn that off. But what they do is that this action allows other flamingos to know, okay, X flamingo is doing this dance. So me, Y flamingo knows that they are ready to have a mate. Or they're looking for a mate. Probably a better way to say it. And for flamingos, this is the evolutionary stable strategy. Because all flamingos doing this same dance all around the world, it's not like a flamingo in Chile does a different thing from a flamingo anywhere else. They're all doing it all around the world. So they're predisposed to that action, the dance. And when the social setting calls for dance, they break down and dance because they're acting as an organism, as an individual within a population undergoing unspoken rules of action. And now let's review what we've talked about so far because we've put this argument together into some weird acting loop. So when we started this program, we talked about acting. We talked about Konstantin Stanislavski, and we understood that acting is a lie in which the actors portray experiences that they never have physically undergone. Then we spoke of the Japanese faces. We connected acting to your first and second faces, the ones that you show to the public and to your close friends and family. We move one step further and we talk about Eric Goffman and his dramaturgical approach to social interaction. We talked about his front stage and backstage. And we said that the first two faces of the Japanese three faces are the front stage, and the third face is the backstage. When we spoke about the dramaturgical theory, we understood that impression management is something undergone by actors to bend their backstage into different social interactions at the front stage. What we did with that was connect it to class. We asked, what is class? And we understood that class fits social situations. We understood that actions of class were at one end of our social scale, and actions that are taboo were at the other. And that brought us to our discussion of informal social sanctions, where people positively or negatively reinforce actions in the society, and that creates certainty in what another person should do. When these actions are conducted in certain situations over and over, we said that we can classify people into those situations and into a subset of people. What this brought us to was our discussion of social caste and class system. And when we identify ourselves in class-based systems, we get to our biological glitch that helps us understand why we do these things. And when we reach that conclusion, we find ourselves at the precipice of action, action as an organism in situations because we can't be our truest self in our social world because if we were to do so we would be too vulnerable to act accordingly to the situation and today we struggle with this idea of retaining our vulnerabilities because social media is a thing and when we think of vulnerabilities we think of private lives since they lie within the third face but now what social media is doing is putting our backstage to the front. What this actually does, however, is engage a new form of acting. Proposed vulnerabilities become social cachet because when they're advertised in the right way, they can lead to increased social standing. Think of the most popular people on a social media service like Instagram. The people pouring their lives on Instagram with stories that take place throughout their day, every day. Think of the Instagram models that quite literally expose themselves on these media services. For most people, their bare skin is the truest reflection of what they are. It's their most private thing. But these people on the social media services, they bring that to the center stage and they get tens upon tens of thousands of followers for it. They're gaining social capital in the form of fame. These kinds of people are creating lives on the internet. They're acting. They're living a form of themselves that they've only experienced in theory, in social media. There's no way their life is as perfect as they propose on these services. And you hate to say that because as a person, you want all others, including yourself, to live the best life possible. But everyone has problems. Everybody's living with some sort of demons. So how do they create these things, these lives that undergo actions that seem so well-versed 
even in their most vulnerable states, in their most private self. These people are putting on an act in their private lives, and they're still playing up the front stage. They still aren't revealing their truest self, their backstage, their third face, because everyone is scared to live who they truly are. And because everyone is scared to do that, it's no one's fault that that happens. It just does, because that's what life is. And it's sad that it's that way, because you hope for everyone to live their happiest self, their truest reflection of who they should be. At least we can find solace in the fact that we all experience this. We all experience the human experience because that's who we are. We're all human. On our social media services, we put the best of who we are, even if it's a little manipulated from what it truly is. Because why look at life in the negative sense? Always put your best foot forward. Be a class act. Do good. Just because we've determined that acting is based on a lie or a trick doesn't mean it has to be a malicious one. Bend yourself slightly to fit the situation. Don't break yourself. We must manage our backstages in this way. Our front stage should merely be a reflection of what our backstage is. We may hide our vulnerabilities, and that's okay, but don't veer too far from them. Try and be your truest self, because the world just wants to see you. I just want to see you, so don't be afraid to show us who you really are. As Konstantin Stanislavski put it, quote, Love the art in yourself, and not yourself in the art. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Logs, a podcast dedicated to understanding. Please subscribe so you're notified of new episodes and find us anywhere you find podcasts. And please remember to laugh a little.